Watch officer, eight bells. Chapter 1, Loomings, call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is a way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself growing grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, Whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping into the street and methodically knocking people's hats off, then I account it high time to get to sea as soon as I can. This is my substitute for pistol and ball. With a philosophical flourish, Cato throws himself upon his sword. I quietly take to the ship. There is nothing surprising in this. If they but knew it, almost all men in their degree, sometime or other, cherish very nearly the same feelings towards the ocean with me. There now is your insular city of the Manhattoes, belted round by wharves as Indian Isles by coral reefs. Commerce surrounds it with her surf. Right and left, the streets take you waterward. Its extreme downtown is the Battery, where that noble mole is washed by waves and cooled by breezes, which a few hours previous were out of sight of land. Look at the crowds of water gazers there. Circumambulate the city of a dreamy Sabbath afternoon. Go from Corlier's Hook to Coenty's Slip, and from thence by Whitehall northward. What do you see? Posted like silent sentinels all around the town, stand thousands upon thousands of mortal men fixed in ocean reveries. Some leaning against the spiles, some seated upon the pier heads, some looking over the bulwarks of ships from China, some high aloft in the rigging as if striving to get a still better seaward peep. But these are all landsmen of weekdays pent up in lath and plaster, tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks. How then is this? Are the green fields gone? What do they hear? But look, here come more crowds pacing straight for the water and seemingly bound for a dive. Strange. Nothing will content them but the extremist limit of the land. Loitering under the shady lee of yonder warehouses will not suffice. No, they must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can without failing. And there they stand, miles of them, leagues, inlanders all. They come from lanes and alleys, street avenues, north, east, south, and west. Yet here, they all unite. Tell me, does the magnetic virtue of the needles of the compasses of all those ships attract them thither? Once more, Say you are in the country, in some high land of lakes. Take almost any path you please, and ten to one it carries you down in a dale and leaves you there by a pool in the stream. There is magic in it. Let the most absent-minded of men be plunged in his deepest reveries, stand that man on his legs, set his feet a-going, and he will infallibly lead you to water if water there be in all that region. Should you ever be a thirst in the great American desert, try this experiment. If your caravan happened to be supplied with a metaphysical professor. Yes, as everyone knows, meditation and water are wedded forever. But here is an artist. He desires to paint you the dreamiest, shadiest, quietest, most enchanting bit of romantic landscape in all the valley of the Sacco. What is the chief element he employs? There stand his trees, each with a hollow trunk, as if a hermit and a crucifix were within. 
and here sleeps his meadow, and there sleep his cattle, and up from yonder cottage goes a sleepy smoke. Deep into the distant woodlands winds a mazy way, reaching to overlapping spurs of mountains bathed in their hillside blue. But though the picture lies thus tranced, and though this pine tree shakes down its sighs like leaves upon this shepherd's head, yet all were vain unless the shepherd's eye were fixed upon the magic stream before him. Go visit the prairies in June, when for scores on scores of miles you wade knee deep among tiger lilies. What is the one charm wanting? Water there is not a drop of water there. Were Niagara but a cataract of sand, would you travel your thousand miles to see it? Why did the poor poet of Tennessee, upon suddenly receiving two handfuls of silver, deliberate whether to buy him a coat, which he sadly needed, or invest his money in a pedestrian trip to Rockaway Beach? Why is almost every robust, healthy boy with a robust, healthy soul in him at some time or other crazy to go to sea? Why upon your first voyage as a passenger did you yourself feel such a mystical vibration when first told that you and your ship were now out of sight of land? Why did the old Persians hold the sea holy? Why did the Greeks give it a separate deity an own brother of Jove. Surely this is not without meaning, and still deeper the meaning of that story of Narcissus, who because he could not grasp the tormenting, mild image he saw in the fountain, plunged into it and was drowned. But that same image we ourselves see in all rivers and oceans, it's the image of the ungraspable phantom of life. And this is the key to it all. Now, when I say that I am in the habit of going to sea whenever I begin to grow hazy about the eyes and begin to be overconscious of my lungs, I do not mean to have it inferred that I ever go to sea as a passenger. For to go as a passenger, you must needs have a purse, and a purse is but a rag unless you have something in it. Besides, passengers get seasick, grow quarrelsome, don't sleep of nights, do not enjoy themselves much as a general thing. No, I never go as a passenger, nor though I am something of a salt, do I ever go to sea as a commodore or captain or a cook. I abandon the glory and distinction of such offices in those who like them. For my part, I abominate all honorable, respectable toils, trails and tribulations of every kind whatsoever. It is quite as much as I can do to take care of myself without taking care of ships, barks, brigs, schooners, and whatnot. As for going as cook, though I confess there is considerable glory in that, a cook being a sort of officer on shipboard, yet somehow I never fancied broiling fowls. Though once broiled, judiciously buttered, and, judgment, uh, and judgmatically salted and peppered, there is no one who will speak more respectfully, not to say reverentially, of a broiled fowl than I. It is out of the idolatrous dotings of the old Egyptians upon broiled ibis and roasted river horse that you see the mummies of those creatures in their huge bakehouses, the pyramids. No, when I go to sea, I go to sea as a simple sailor. Right before the mast, plumb down into the forecastle, aloft there to the royal masthead. True, they rather order me about some and make me jump from spar to spar like a grasshopper in a May meadow. And at first, this sort of thing is unpleasant enough. It touches one's sense of honor particularly if you come from an old established family in the land, the Van Rensselaers or Randolphs or Hardy Canutes. And more than all, if just previous to putting your hand into the tar pot, you've been lording it as a country schoolmaster, making the tallest boys stand in awe of you. The transition is a keen one, I assure you, 
from a schoolmaster to a sailor and requires a strong decoction of Seneca and the Stoics to enable you to grin and bear it. But even this wears off in time. What of it? If some old hunks of a sea captain orders me to get a broom and sweep down the decks, what does that indignity amount to? Weighed, I mean, in the scales of the New Testament. Do you think the archangel Gabriel thinks anything the less of me because I promptly and respectfully obey that old hunks in that particular instance? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Well then, however the old sea captains may order me about, however they may thump and punch me about, I have the satisfaction of knowing that it is all right. That everybody else, in one way or other, served in much the same way, either in a physical or metaphysical point of view, that is. And so the universal thump is passed round and all hands should rub each other's shoulder blades and be content. Again, I always go to sea as a sailor because they make a point of paying me for my trouble, whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I ever heard of. On the contrary, passengers themselves must pay, and there is all the difference in the world between paying and being paid. The act of paying is perhaps the most uncomfortable infliction that the two orchard thieves entailed upon us. But being paid, what will compare with it? The urbane activity with which a man receives money is really marvelous, considering that we so earnestly believe money to be the root of all earthly ills and that on no account can a moneyed man enter heaven. Ah, how cheerly we, cheerfully we consign ourselves to perdition. Finally, I always go to sea as a sailor because of the wholesome exercise and pure air of the forecastle deck. For as in this world, headwinds are far more prevalent than winds from astern, that is, if you never violate the Pythagorean maxim. So for the most part, the Commodore on the rear deck, on the quarter deck, gets his atmosphere at second hand from the sailors in the forecastle. He thinks he breathes at first, but not so. In much the same way do the commonality lead their leaders in many other things at the same time that the leaders little suspect it. But wherefore it was that after having repeatedly smelt the sea as a merchant sailor, I should now take it into my head to go on a whaling voyage. This the invisible police officer of the fates, who has the constant surveillance of me and secretly dogs me and influences me in some unaccountable way he can better answer than anyone. And doubtless, my going on this whaling voyage formed part of a grand program of providence that was drawn up a long time ago. It came in as a sort of brief interlude and solo between more extensive performances. I take it that this part of the bill must have run something like this. Grand contested election for the presidency of the United States whaling voyage by one Ishmael, bloody battle in Afghanistan. Though I cannot tell why it was exactly that the, those stage managers, the fates, put me down for this shabby part of a whaling voyage when others were set down for magnificent parts in high tragedies and short and easy parts in genteel comedies and jolly parts in farces. Though I cannot tell exactly why this was, yet now that I recall all the circumstances, I think I can see a little into the springs and motives, which being cunningly presented
to me under various disguises induced me to set about performing the part I did, besides cajoling me into the delusion that it was a choice resulting from my own unbiased free will and discriminating judgment. Chief among these motives was the overwhelming idea of the great whale himself. Such a portentous and mysterious monster roused all my curiosity. Then the wild and distant seas where he rolled his island bulk, the undeliverable, nameless perils of the whale. These, with all the attending marvels of a thousand Patagonian sights and sounds, helped to sway me to my wish. With other men, perhaps, such things would not have been inducements, but for me, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail to forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. Not ignoring what is good, I'm quick to perceive a horror and could still be social with it, would they, would they let me, since it is but well to be on friendly terms with all the inmates of the place one lodges in. By reason of these things, then, the whaling voyage was welcome. The great floodgates of the wonder world swung open, and in the wild conceits that swayed me to my purpose, two and two there floated into my innermost soul, endless processions of the whale, and mid most of them all, one great hooded phantom, like a snow hill in the air. Chapter two, the carpet bag. <clears throat> I stuffed a shirt or two into my old carpet bag, tucked it under my arm, and started for Cape Horn and the Pacific. Quitting the good city of old Manhattan, I duly arrived in New Bedford. It was a Saturday night in December. Much was I disappointed upon learning that the little packet for Nantucket had already sailed, and that no way of reaching that place would offer till the following Monday. As most young candidates for the pains and penalties of whaling stop at this same New Bedford, thence to embark on their voyage, it may as well be related that I, for one, had no idea of so doing. For my mind was made up to sail in no other than a Nantucket craft, because there was a fine, boisterous, something about everything connected with that famous old island, which amazed, amazingly pleased me. Besides, though, New Bedford was of late been gradually monopolizing the business of whaling. And though it, in this matter, poor old Nantucket is now much behind her, yet Nantucket was her great original, the tire of this Carthage, the place where the first dead American whale was stranded. Where else but from Nantucket did those aboriginal whalemen, the redmen, first sally out in canoes to give chase to the Leviathan? And where but from Nantucket, too, did that first adventurous little sloop put forth, partly laden with imported cobblestones, so goes the story, to throw at the whales in order to discover when they were nigh enough to risk harpoon from the bowsprit. Now having a night, a day, and still another night following me in New Bedford, ere could embark for my destined port, it became a matter of concernment where I was to eat and sleep meanwhile. It was a very dubious looking, nay, a very dark and dismal night, bitingly cold and cheerless. I knew no one in the place. With anxious grapnels, I sounded my pocket and only brought up a few pieces of silver. So wherever you go, Ishmael, said I to myself, as I stood in the middle of a dreary street shouldering my bag and comparing the gloom towards the north with the darkness towards the south, wherever in your wisdom you may conclude to lodge for the night, my dear Ishmael, be sure to inquire the price and don't be too particular. With halting steps, I paced the streets and passed the sign of the crossed harpoons, but it looked too expensive and jolly there. Further on from the bright red windows of the Swordfish Inn, there came such fervent rays that it seemed to have melted the packed snow and ice from before the house. For everywhere else, the concealed, congealed frost lay 10 inches thick in a hard asphaltic pavement. 
rather weary for me when I struck my foot against the flinty projections because from hard, remorteless service, the soles of my boots were in a most miserable plight. Too expensive and jolly again, thought I, paused one moment to watch the broad glare in the street and hear the sounds of the tinkling glasses within. But go on, Ishmael, said I at last. Don't you hear? Get away from before the door. Your patched boots are stomping the way. So I went, and now by instinct followed the streets that took me waterward. From there, doubtless, were the cheapest, if not the cheeriest, inns. Such dreary streets, blocks of blackness, not houses on either hand, and here and there a candle, like a candle moving about in a tomb. At this hour of the night, on the last day of the week, that quarter of the town proved all but deserted, but presently I came to a smoky light proceeding from a low, wide building, the door of which stood invitingly open. It had a careless look, as if it were meant for the uses of the public, so entering, the first thing I did was to stumble over an ash box in the porch. Ha, thought I, ha, as the flying particles almost choked me. Are these the ashes from that destroyed city, Gomorrah? But the crossed harpoons and the swordfish, this then must needs be the sign of the trap. However, I picked myself up and hearing a loud voice within, pushed on and opened a second interior door. It seemed the great black parliament sitting in top it. A hundred black faces turned round in their rows to peer. And beyond, a black angel of doom was beating a book in the pulpit. It was a Negro church. And the preacher's text was about the blackness of darkness and the weeping and wailing and teeth gnashing there. Ha, Ishmael, muttered I, backing out. Wretched entertainment at the sign of the trap. Moving on, I at last came to a dim sort of light not far from the docks and heard a forlorn creaking in the air. And looking up, saw a swinging sign over the door with a white painting upon it, faintly representing tall straight jet of misty spray. And these words underneath, the spouter in, Peter Coffin. Coffin? Spouter? Rather ominous in that particular connection, thought I, but it isn't a common name in Nantucket, they say, and I suppose this Peter here is an immigrant from there, as the light looked so dim and the place for the time looked quiet enough, and the dilapidated little wooden house itself looked as if it might have been carted from here from the ruins of some burnt district, and as the swinging sign had a poverty-stricken sort of creak to it, I thought that here was the very spot for cheap lodgings and the best of pea coffee. It was a queer sort of place, a gable-ended old house, one side palsied, as it were, and leaning over sadly. It stood on a sharp, bleak corner where that tempestuous wind, Eurachlodon, kept up a worse howling than it ever did about poor Paul's tossed craft. Eurachlodon, nevertheless, is a mighty pleasant zephyr to anyone indoors, with its feet on the hob quietly toasting for bed. In judging of that tempestuous wind called Eurachlodon, says an old writer of whose works I possess the only copy extant, it maketh a marvelous difference whether thou lookest out at from a glass window where the frost is all on the outside, or whether thou observest it from the sashless window where the frost is on both sides, and of which the white death is the only glazier. True enough, thought I, as the passage occurred to my mind, old black letter, thou resonest well. Yes, these eyes are windows, and this body of mine is the house. What a pity they didn't stop up the chinks and the crannies, though, and thrust in a little lint here and there. But it's too late to make any improvements now. The universe is finished. The copestone is on, and the chips were carted off a million years ago. Poor Lazarus there, chattering his teeth against the curbstone for his pillow and shaking off his tatters with his shiverings. He might plug up both ears with rags and put a corn cob into his mouth, and, that yet, and yet that would not keep out the tempestuous Eurachlodon. Eurachlodon, says old Dives in his red silken wrapper. He had a redder one afterwards. Pooh, pooh, what a fine frosty night. How Orion glitters. Climbed, 
what northern lights. Let them talk of their oriental summer climbs of everlasting conservatories. Give me the privilege of making my own summer with my own coals. But what thinks Lazarus? Can he warm his blue hands by holding them up the grand northern lights? Would not Lazarus rather be in Sumatra than here? Would he not far rather lay him down lengthwise along the, light of the, the line of the equator? Yea, ye gods, go down to the fiery pit itself in order to keep out this frost? Now that Lazarus should lie stranded there on the curbstone before the door of the dives, this is more wonderful than that, than that an iceberg should be moored to one of the Molaccas. Yet dives himself, he too lives like a Tsar in the ice palace made of frozen size. And being a president of a temperance in society, he only drinks the tepid tears of orphans. But no more of this blubbering now. We are going a-wailing, and there is plenty of that yet to come. Let us scrape the ice from our frosted feet and see what sort of place this spouter may be. Chapter 3. Entering the gable-ended spouter inn, you found yourself in a wide, low, struggling entry with old-fashioned wainscoats reminding one of the bulk warts of some condemned old craft. On one side hung a very large oil painting so thoroughly besmoked and every way defaced that in the unequal cross lights by which you viewed it, it was only by diligent study and a series of systematic visits to it and careful in inquiry of the neighbors that you could any way arrive at an understanding of its purpose. Such unaccountable masses of shades and shadows that at first you almost thought some ambitious young artist in the time of the New England hags had, ende had endeavored to delineate chaos bewitched. But by dint of much and earnest contemplation and oft-repeated ponderings, and especially by throwing open the little window towards the back of the entry, you at last come to the conclusion that such an idea, however wild, might not be altogether unwarranted. But what most puzzled and confused you was a long, limber, portentous black mass of something hovering in the center of the picture over three blue, dim, perpendicular lines floating in a nameless yeast. A boggy, soggy, squitchy picture, truly, enough to drive a nervous man distracted. Yet there was sort of an indefinite, half-attained, unimaginable sublimity about it that fairly froze you to it till you involuntarily took an oath with, with yourself to find out what that marvelous painting meant. Ever and anon, a bright, but alas, deceptive idea would dart you through. It's the Black Sea in a midnight gale. It's the unnatural combat of the four primal elements. It's a blasted heath. It's a hyperborean winter scene. It's the breaking up of the ice-bound stream of time. But at last, all these fancies yielded to one pretentious something in the picture's mist. That once found out, and all the rest were plain. But stop. Does it not bear a faint resemblance to a gigantic fish? Even the great Leviathan himself? In fact, the artist's design seemed, seemed this, a final theory of my own, partly based upon the aggregated opinions of many aged persons with whom I conversed upon the subject. The picture represents a Cape Horner in a great hurricane, the half-foundered ship wel weltering there with its three dismantled masts alone visible and an exasperated whale, purposing to spring clean over the craft is in the enormous act of impaling himself upon the three mastheads. The opposite wall of this entry was hung all over with a heatheneth, heathenist array of monstrous clubs and spears. Some were thickly set with glittering teeth resembling ivory saws. Other, others were tufted with knots of human hair 
and one was sickle-shaped with a vast handle sweeping round like the segment made in the new-mourn grass by a long-armed mower. You shuddered as you gazed and wondered what monstrous cannibal and savage could ever gone a death harvesting with such a hacking, horrifying implement. Mixed with these were rusty old whaling lances and harpoons all broken and deformed. Some were storied weapons, poons all broken and deformed. Some were storied weapons, with this once long lance now wildly elbowed 50 years ago did Nathan Swain kill 15 whales between a sunrise and a sunset. And that harpoon, so like a corkscrew now, was flung in Javan seas and run away with by a whale, years afterwards slain off the Cape of Blanco. The original iron entered nigh the tail, and like a restless needle sojourning in the body of a man, traveled full 40 feet and at last was found embedded in the hump. Crossing the dusky entry and on through yon low, low arched way, cut through what in old times must have been a great central chimney with fireplaces all round, you enter the public room. A still duskier place is this, with such low ponderous beams above and such old wrinkled planks beneath that you would almost fancy you trod some old craft's cockpits, especially of such a howling night when this corner anchored old ark rocked so furiously. On one side stood a long, low, shelf-like shelf -like table covered with cracked glass cases filled with dusty rarities gathered from the wide world's remotest nooks. Projecting from the farther angle of the room stands a dark-looking den, the bar, a rude attempt at a right whale's head. But that how it may, there stands the vast arched bone of the whale's jaw, so wide a coach might almost drive beneath it. Within are shabby shelves, ranged round with old decanters, bottles, flasks, and in those jaws of swift destruction, like another cursed Jonah, by which name indeed they called him, bustles a little withered old man, who for their money dearly sells the sailor's deliriums and death. Abominable are the tumblers into which he pours his poison. Though true cylinders without, within, the villainous green goggling glasses deceitfully taper downwards to a cheating bottom. Parallel meridians rudely pecked into the glass surround these footpads goblets. Fill to this mark, and your charge is but a penny. To this is a penny more, and so on to the full glass, the Cape Horn measure, which you may gulp down for a shilling. Upon entering the place, I found a number of young seamen gathered around a table, examining by a dim light diverse specimens of scrimshander. I sought the landlord, and telling him I desired to be accommodated with a room, received for answer that his house was full, not a bed unoccupied. But a vast, he added, tapping his forehead, you ain't no objections to share in a harpooner's blanket, have ye? I suppose you're going to Wareland, so you'd better get used to that sort of thing. I told him that I never liked to sleep too in a bed, that if I should ever do so, it would depend on who the harpooner might be, and that if he, the landlord, really had no other place for me, and the harpooner was not decidedly objectionable, why, rather than wander further about a strange town on so bitter a night, I would put up with the half of any decent man's blanket. I thought so. All right, take a seat. Supper? You want supper? Supper will be ready directly. I sat down on an old wooden settle carved all over like a bench on the battery. At one end, a ruminating tar was still further adorning it with his jackknife, stooping over and diligently working away at the space between his legs. He was trying his hand at a ship under full sail, but he didn't make much headway, I thought. At last, some four or five of us were summoned to our meal in an adjoining room. It was cold as Iceland, no fire at all. The landlord said he couldn't afford it. Nothing but two dismal tallow candles, each in a winding sheet. We were fain to button up our monkey jackets and hold to our lips cups of scalding tea with our half-frozen fingers. But the fare was the most substantial kind. Not only meat and potatoes, but dumplings. Good heavens, dumplings for supper. One young fellow in a green box coat addressed himself to these dumplings in a most direful manner. My boy, said the landlord, you'll have the nightmare to a dead certainty. Landlord, I whispered, 
that ain't the harpooner, is it? Oh, no, said he, looking uh, sort of diabolically funny. That harpooner is a dark complexion chap. He never eats dumplings. He only eats nothing but steaks, and he likes them rare. The devil he does, says I. Where is that harpooner? Is he here? He'll, he'll be here before long, was the answer. I could not help it, but I began to feel suspicious of this dark-complexioned harpooner. At any rate, I made up my mind that if it so turned out that we should sleep together, he must undress and get into bed before I did. Supper over, the company went back to the bar room when, knowing not what else to do with myself, I resolved to spend the rest of the evening as a looker-on. Presently, a rioting noise was heard without, starting up. The landlord cried, that's the Grumpus's crew. I seed her reported in the offing this morning. A three years voyage and a full ship. Her boys now will have the latest news from the Fijis. A trampling of sea boots was heard in the entry. The door was flung open and in rolled a wild set of mariners enough. Enveloped in their shaggy watch coats and with their heads muffled in woolen comforters all bedarned and ragged and their beards stiff with icicles, they seemed an eruption of bears from Labrador. They had just landed from their boat and this was the first house they entered. No wonder then that they made a straight wake for the whale's mouth, the bar, when the wrinkled little old Jonah there officiating soon poured them out brimmers all around. One complained of a bad head cold in his head, upon which Jonah mixed him a pitch-like potion of gin and molasses, which he swore was a sovereign cure for all colds and catars whatever, whatsoever, never mind of how long-standing, or whether caught off the coast of Labrador or on the weather side of an ice island. The liquor soon mounted into their heads, as it generally does, even with the Arantus topers newly landed from sea, and they began capering about most obstreperously. I observed, however, that one of them held somewhat aloof, and though he seemed desirous not to spoil the hilarity of his shipmates by his own sober face, yet upon the whole he refrained from making as much noise as the rest. This man interested me at once, and since the sea gods had ordained that he should soon become my shipmate, though but a sleeping partner one, so far as this narrative is concerned, I will here venture upon a little description of him. He stood full six feet in height with noble shoulders and a chest like a coffer dam. I have seldom seen such brawn in a man. His face was deeply brown and burnt, making his white teeth dazzling by the contrast while in the deep shadows of his eyes floated some reminiscences that did not seem to give him much joy. His voice at once announced that he was a southerner, and from his fine stature, I thought he must be one of those tall mountaineers from the Allegheny Ridge in Virginia. When the revelry of his companions had mounted to its height, this man slipped away unobserved, and I saw no more of him until he became my comrade on the sea. In a few minutes, however, he was missed by his shipmates, and being, it seems, for some reason, a huge favorite with them, they raised a cry, Balkington, Balkington, where's Balkington? And darted out of the house in pursuit of him. It was now about nine o'clock, and the room seeming almost supernaturally quiet after these orgies, I began to congratulate myself upon a little plan that had occurred to me just previous to the entrance of the seamen. No man prefers to sleep two in a bed. In fact, you'd a good deal rather not sleep with your own brother. I don't know how it is, but people like to be private when they're sleeping. And when it comes to sleeping with an unknown stranger in a strange inn, in a strange town, and that stranger a harpooner, then your objections indefinitely multiply. Nor was there any earthly reason why I, as a sailor, should sleep two in a bed more than anybody else. For sailors no more sleep two in a bed at sea than bachelor kings do ashore. To be sure, they all sleep together in one apartment, but you have your own hammock, and you cover yourself with your own blanket, and you sleep in your own skin. The more I pondered over this harpooner, the more I abominated the thought of sleeping with him. It was fair to presume that being a harpooner, his linen or woolen, as the case may be, would not be of the tidiest, certainly none of the finest, I began to twitch all over, 
Besides, it was getting late, and my decent harpooner ought to be home and going bedwards. Suppose now he should tumble in upon me at midnight. How could I tell from what vile hole he had been coming? Landlord, I've changed my mind about that harpooner. I won't sleep with him. I'll try the bench here, just as you please. I'm sorry, I can't spare you a tablecloth for a mattress and it's a plaguey rough board here, feeling of the knots and notches. But wait a minute, Scrimshander, I've got a carpenter's plane there in the bar. Wait, I say, I'll make you snug enough. So saying, he procured the plane and with his old silk handkerchief first dusting the bench, vigorously set to planing away at my bed, the whole while grinning like an ape. The shavings flew right and left till at last the plane iron came bump against an indestructible knot. The landlord was near spraining his wrist. I told him for heaven's sakes to quit it. The bed was soft enough to suit me. I didn't know how all the planing in the world could make eider down of a pine plank. So gathering up the shavings with another grin and throwing them into the great stove in the middle of the room, he went about his business and left me in a brown study. I now took the measure of the bench and found that it was a foot too short, but that could be mended with a chair. But it was also a foot too narrow, and the other bench in the room was about four inches higher than the planed one, so there was no, no yoking them. I then placed the first bench lengthwise along the only clear space against the wall, leaving a little interval between for my back to settle down in but I soon found that there came such a draft of cold air over me from under the sill of the window that this plan would never do at all, especially as another current from the rickety door met the one from the window and both together formed a series of small whirlwinds in the immediate vicinity of the spot where I had thought to spend the night. Devil fetch that harpooner, I thought. But stop, couldn't I steal a march on him, bolt his door inside, jump into his bed, not to be wakened by his most violent knockings. It seemed not a bad idea, but upon second thought I dismissed it. For who could tell but what the next morning, so soon as I popped out of the room, the harpooner might be standing in the entry, all ready to strike me down. Still looking around me again, and seeing no possible chance of spending a sufferable night, unless in some other person's bed, I began to think that after all, I might be cherishing unwarrantable prejudices against this unknown harpooner. Thinks I, I'll wait a while. He must be dropping in before long. I'll have a good look at him then. And perhaps we may become jolly good bedfellows after all. There's no telling. But though the other boarders kept coming in by ones, twos, and threes and going to bed, there was no sign of my harpooner. Landlord, I said, what sort of chap is he? Does he always keep such late hours? It was now hard upon 12 o'clock. The landlord chuckled again with his lean chuckle and seemed to be mighty tickled at something beyond my comprehension. No, he answered, generally, he's an early bird, early to bed, early to rise. Yeah, he's the bird that catches the worm. But tonight, he went out a peddling, you see, and I don't see on what on earth keeps him so late, unless maybe he can't sell his head. Can't sell his head? What sort of a bamboozling story are you telling me? Getting into a towering rage. Do you pretend to say, landlord, that this harpooner is actually engaged this blessed Saturday night, or rather Sunday morning, in peddling his head around this town? That's precisely it, said the landlord. And I told him he couldn't sell it here. The market's overstocked. With what? I shouted, with heads, to be sure. Ain't there too many heads in the world? I'll tell you what it is, landlord, I said quite calmly. You'd better stop spinning that yarn to me. I'm not green. Maybe not, taking out a stick and whittling a toothpick. But I rather guess you'll be done brown if that harpooner hears you slandering his head. I'll break it for him, I said. Now I was flying into a passion against this unaccountable farrago of the landlord's. It's broke already, he said. Broke? I said, broke? What do you mean? Certain. And that's the very reason he can't sell it, I guess. Landlord, said I, going up to him as cool as Mount Hecla in a snowstorm. 
Landlord, stop whittling. You and I must understand one another, and that too without delay. I come to your house and want a bed. You tell me you can only give me half a one, that the other half belongs to a certain harpooner. And about this harpooner, whom I have not yet seen, you persist in telling me the most mystifying and exasperating stories, tending to beget in me an uncomfortable feeling towards the man whom you designed for my bedfellow. A sort of connection, landlord, which is an intimate and confidential one in the highest degree. I now demand of you to speak out and tell me who and what this harpooner is, and whether I shall be in all respects safe to spend the night with him. And in the first place, you will be so good as to unsay that story about selling his head, which if true, I take to be good evidence that this harpooner is stark mad, and I've no idea of sleeping with a madman, and you, sir, you, I mean landlord, you, sir, by trying to induce me to do so knowingly, would thereby render yourself liable to a criminal prosecution. Well, said the landlord, fetching a long breath, that's a pretty long salmon for a chap that rips a little now and then. But be easy, be easy. This here harpooner I have been telling you of has just arrived from the South Seas, where he bought up a lot of bombed New Zealand heads, great curios, you know. And he sold all on them but one, and that one he's trying to sell tonight, because tomorrow's Sunday, and it would not do to be selling human heads about the streets when folks is going to churches. He wanted to last Sunday, but I stopped him just as he was going out the door with four heads strung on a string for all the earth like a string of onions. This account cleared up the otherwise unaccountable mystery and showed that the landlord, after all, had had no idea of fooling me. But at the same time, what could I think of a harpooner who stayed out of a Saturday night, clean into the Holy Sabbath, engaged in such a cannibal business as selling the heads of dead idolaters? Depend upon it, landlord, that harpooner is a dangerous man. He pays, regular, was the rejoinder. But come, it's getting dreadful late. You had better be turning flukes. It's a nice bed. Sal and me slept in that air bed the night we were spliced. There's plenty of room for two to kick about in that bed. It's an almighty big bed, that. Why, afore we give it up, Sal used to put our Sam and little Johnny in the foot of it. But I got a dreamin' and sprawlin' about one night, and somehow Sam got pitched on the floor and came near breaking his arm. Art to that, Sal said it wouldn't do. Come along here, I'll give you a glim in a jiffy. And so saying, he lighted a candle and held it towards me, offering to lead the way. But I stood irresolute. When looking at a clock in the corner, he exclaimed, I vom, it's Sunday. You won't see that harpooner tonight. He's come to anchor somewhere. Come along then, do come. Won't ye come? I considered the matter a moment, and then upstairs we went, and I was ushered into a small room, cold as a clam, and furnished, sure enough, with a prodigious bed, almost big enough indeed for any four harpooners to sleep abreast. There, said the landlord, placing the candle on a crazy old sea chest that did double duty as a washstand and center table. There, make yourself comfortable now, and good night to ye. I turned round from eyeing the bed, but he had disappeared. Folding back the counterpane, I stood, stooped over the bed. Though none of the most elegant, it yet stood the scrutiny tolerably well. I then glanced around the room, and besides the bedstead and center table, could see no other furniture belonging to the place, but a rude shelf, the four walls, and a papered fireboard representing a man striking a whale. Of things not properly belonging to the room, there was a hammock lashed up and thrown upon the floor in one corner, also a large seaman's bag containing the harpooner's wardrobe, no doubt in lieu of a land trunk. Likewise, there was a parcel of outlandish bonefish hooks on the shelf over the fireplace, and a tall harpoon standing by the head of the bed. But what is this on the chest? I took it up and held it close to the light, and felt it, and smelt it, and tried every way possible to arrive at some satisfactory conclusion concerning it. I can compare it to nothing but a large doormat, ornamented at the edges with little tinkling tags, something like the stained porcupine quills round an Indian moccasin. There was a hole or slit in the middle of this mat, as you see the same in South American ponchos. 
but could it be possible that any sober harpooner would get into a doormat and parade the streets of any Christian town in that sort of guise? I put it on to try it, and it weighed me down like a hamper, being uncommonly shaggy and thick, and I thought a little damp, as though this mysterious harpooner had been wear wearing it of a rainy day. I went up in it to a bit of glass stuck against the wall, and I never saw such a sight in my life. I tore myself out of it in such a hurry that I gave myself a kink in the neck. I sat down on the side of the bed and commenced thinking about this head-pedaling harpooner and his doormat. After thinking some time on the bedside, I got up and took off my monkey jacket and then stood in the middle of the room thinking. I then took off my coat and thought a little more in my shirt sleeves. But beginning to feel very cold now, half undressed as I was, and remembering what the landlord said about the harpooners not coming home at all that night, it being so very late, I made no more ado, but jumped out of my pantaloons and boots, and then blowing out of the light, tumbled into bed and commended myself to the care of heaven. Whether that mattress was stuffed with corn cobs or broken crockery, there is no telling, but I rolled about a good deal and could not sleep for a long time. At last, I slid off into a light doze and had pretty nearly made a good offing towards the land of Nod when I heard a heavy footfall in the passage and saw a glimmer of light come into the room from under the door. Lord, save me, thinks I. That must be the harpooner, the infernal head peddler. But I lay perfectly still and resolved not to say a word till spoken to. Holding a light in one hand and that identical New Zealand head in the other, the stranger entered the room and without looking towards the bed, placed his candle a good way off from me on the floor in one corner, and then began working away at the knotted cords of the large bag I before spoke of as being in the room. I was all eagerness to see his face, but he kept it averted for some time while employed in unlacing the bag's mouth. This accomplished, however, he turned round when, good heavens, what a sight, such a face. It was of a dark purplish yellow color, here and there stuck over with large blackish looking squares. Yes, it's just as I thought. He's a terrible bedfellow. He's been in a fight, got dreadfully cut, and here he is just from the surgeon. But at that moment, he chanced to turn his face so towards the light that I plainly saw that they could not be sticking plasters at all, those black squares on his cheeks. They were stains of some sort or another. At first, I knew not what to make of this, but soon an inkling of the truth occurred to me. I remembered a story of a white man, a whale man too, who falling among the cannibals had been tattooed by them. I concluded that this harpooner, in the course of his distant voyages, must have met with a similar adventure. And what is it, thought I, after all? It's only his outside. A man can be honest in any sort of skin. But then, what to make of his unearthly complexion? That part of it, I mean, lying round about and completely independent of the squares of tattooing. To be sure, it might be nothing but a good coat of tropical tanning, but I never heard of a hot sun's tanning a white man into a purplish yellow one. However, I had never been to the South Seas, and perhaps the sun there produced these extraordinary effects upon the skin. Now, while all these ideas were passing through me like lightning, this harpooner never noticed me at all. But after some difficulty, having opened his bag, he commenced fumbling in it and presently pulled out a sort of tomahawk and a sealskin wallet with a hair on. Placing these on the chest in the middle of the room, he then took the New Zealand head, a ghastly thing enough, and crammed it down into the bag. He now took off his hat, a new beaver hat, when I came nigh singing out with fresh surprise. There was no hair on his head, none to speak of at least, nothing but a small scalp knot twisted up on his forehead. His bald purplish head now looked for all the world like a mildewed skull. Had not the stranger stood between me and the door, I would have bolted out of it quicker than ever I bolted a dinner. Even as it was, I thought something of slipping out of the window, but it was the second floor back. I am no coward, but what to make of this head-peddling purple rascal altogether past my comprehension. Ignorance is the parent of fear, and being completely nonplussed and confounded about the stranger, I confess I was now as much afraid of him as if it was the devil himself who had thus broken into my room at the dead of night. In fact, I was so afraid of him 
that I was not gave enough just then to address him and demand a satisfactory answer concerning what seemed inexplicable in him. Meanwhile, he continued the business of undressing and at last showed his chest and arms. As I live, these covered parts of him were checkered with the same squares as his face. His back, too, was all over the same dark squares. He seemed to have been in a 30 years war and just escaped from it with a sticking plaster shirt. Still more, his very legs were marked as if a parcel of dark green frogs were running up the trunks of young palms. It was now quite plain that he must be some abominable savage or other shipped aboard of a whaleman in the South Seas and so landed in this Christian country. I quaked to think of it. A peddler of heads too, perhaps the heads of his own brothers. He might take a fancy to mine. Heavens, look at that tomahawk. But there was no time for shuddering, for now the savage went about something that completely fascinated my attention and convinced me that he must indeed be a heathen. Going to his heavy grego, or wrap all, or dreadnought, which he had previously hung on a chair, he fumbled in the pockets and produced at length a curious little deformed image with a hunch on its back, and exactly the color of a three days old Congo baby. Remembering the embalmed head, at first I almost thought that this black mannequin was a real baby preserved in some similar manner. But seeing that it was not at all limber, and then it glistened a good deal like polished ebony. I concluded that it must be nothing but a wooden idol, which indeed it proved to be. For now the savage goes up to the empty fireplace and removing the papered fireboard sets up this little hunchbacked image like a 10 pin between the andirons. The chimney jams and all the bricks inside were very sooty so that I thought this fireplace made a very appropriate little shrine or chapel for his Congo idol. I now screwed my eyes hard toward the half-hidden image, feeling but ill at ease, meantime, to see what was next to follow. First, he takes about a double handful of shavings out of his Grego pocket and places them carefully before the idol. Then, laying a bit of ship biscuit on top and applying the flame from the lamp, he kindled the shavings into a sacrificial blaze. Presently, after many hasty snatches into the fire, and still hastier withdrawals of his fingers, whereby he seemed to be scorching them badly, he at least succeeded in drawing out a biscuit. Then, blowing off the heat and ashes a little, he made a polite offer of it to the little Negro. But the little devil did not seem to fancy such dry sort of fare at all. He never moved his lips. All these strange antics were accompanied by still stranger guttural noises from the devotee which seemed to be praying in a sing-song or else singing some pagan psalmody or other, during which his face twitched about in the most unnatural manner. At last, extinguishing the fire, he took the idol up very unceremoniously and bagged it again in his grego pocket, as carelessly as if he were a sportsman bagging a dead woodcock. All these queer proceedings increased my uncomfortableness, and seeing him now exhibiting strong symptoms of concluding his business operations and jumping into bed with me, I thought it was high time, now or never, before the light was put out, to break the spell in which I had so long been bound. But the interval I spent in delivering what to say was a fatal one. Taking up his tomahawk from the table, he examined the head of it for an instant, and then holding it to the light, with his mouth at the handle, he puffed out great clouds of tobacco smoke. The next moment the light was extinguished, and this wild cannibal, tomahawk between his teeth, sprang into bed with me. I sang out, I could not help it now, and giving a sudden grunt of astonishment, he began feeling me. Stammering out something I knew not what, I rolled away from him against the wall, and then conjured him, whoever or whatever he might be, to keep quiet and let me get up and light the lamp again. But his guttural responses satisfied me at once that he but ill comprehended my meaning. Who e double you, he at last said. You no speak ye, damn me, I kill he. And so, saying the lighted tomahawk began flourishing about me in the dark. Landlord, for God's sake, Peter Coffin, shouted I. Landlord, watch, Coffin, angels, save me. Speak ye. Tell me who he be, or damn me, I kill ye, again growled the cannibal, while his horrid flourishings of the tomahawk scattered the hot tobacco ashes about me till I thought my linen would get on fire. But thank heaven, at that moment, the landlord came into the room, light in hand, and leaping from the bed, I ran up to him. 
Don't be afraid now, said he, grinning again. Queequeg here wouldn't harm a hair of your head. Stop your grinning, shouted I, and why didn't you tell me that that infernal harpooner was a cannibal? I thought you'd know it, didn't I tell you? He was peddling heads around town. But turn flukes again and go to sleep. Queequeg, look here. You sabi me, I sabi. You this man sleepy you, you sabi? Me sabi plenty, grunted Queequeg, puffing away at his pipe and sitting up in bed. You get in, he added, motioning to me with his tomahawk and throwing the clothes to one side. He really did this, and not only a civil, but a really kind and charitable way. I stood looking at him a moment. For all his tattooings, he was on the whole a clean, comely looking cannibal. What's all this fuss I have been making about, thought I to myself. The man's a human being, just as I am. He has just as much reason to fear me as I have to be afraid of him. Better sleep with a sober cannibal than a drunken Christian. Landlord, said I, tell him to stash his tomahawk there, or pipe, or whatever you call it. Tell him to stop smoking, in short, and I will turn in with him. But I don't fancy having a man smoking in bed with me. It's dangerous. Besides, I ain't insured. This being told to Queequeg, he at once complied, and again politely mentioned me to get into bed, rolling over to one side as much as to say, I won't touch a leg of ye. Good night, landlord, said I. You may go. I turned in and never slept better in my life. <laughs>